A, if you're comfortable with it, then B, do we um, solidify more into a, a policy that can easily be brought up and discussed in the future? I have a question just on that. Is this just for city property or yes. for private? Just, just city property. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, Mayor, members of the City Council, Sean Muir, Community Services Manager. Thank you, Mr. Hellman, for the introduction to this presentation. Um, as was mentioned, we just want to bring, bring up the, the use of artificial turf in the city. Um, we'll start off with a little bit of um, background and historical context, um, update you on some of the research that staff has done, um, some of the pros and cons of the use of artificial turf, and then um, discuss the current informal policy and potential next steps. So this is a little bit of background, a timeline um, as to when this council has heard um, any information about artificial turf or done any policy setting related to drought and water conservation as well. And so we have in 2014, um, a joint water conservation cost sharing program um, was put into place and that was for residential turf remo uh, removal. And that's that was unanimously approved at the time. In 2015, there was a citizen sustainability committee uh, that discussed the use of gray water to irrigate medians uh, golf course water uh, use reductions and brown lawn allowances during the drought. Uh, the turf buyback program was also gearing up at that time once again. Um, in 2015 as well, there was a, a comprehensive water conservation strategy uh, that implemented temporary water reductions, two phases of turf reduction projects at Civic Center um, and median landscaping on El Paseo. The council at that time discussed concerns over areas of the parks going brown, Palm Desert's already sustainable approach to landscaping and how that made it difficult to implement the um, state water reduction, 36% um, uh, requirement. And then in 2016, um, approximately one acre of turf uh, on El Paseo had been in question as to whether it would remain and the city had conserved so much in other areas, El Paseo, um, was designated as an active uh, use area. And um, there had been so many water conservation uh, projects in other areas of the city that it was decided that that would be active use and um, conserved as actual natural grass. That was a unanimous vote uh, to continue maintaining the natural turf. Again, in 2016, oh, I'm sorry, I went over that. In 2018, um, we had a commissioner on the Parks and Rec Committee that did some research um, about the use of artificial turf uh, through University of Oregon, and that was more about sports fields. And it was, um, at the time, not looked upon favorably because of the heat coming off of it, um, the disposal of it, and then the potential for injury. And then um, more recently, um, this council had been contacted by a resident who um, was in favor of the National um, Football League's Players Association, who has experienced, um, several players have experienced injuries that they chalk up to um, the use of artificial turf on NFL fields. So now I just wanna walk you through a couple of the turf removal projects that have been conducted in the city. And for that, we'll bring up uh, Randy Chavez, Deputy Director of Public Works, who had firsthand knowledge of these projects. Good afternoon, um, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. So these projects just highlight how uh, the city has been responsible stewards with our natural resources, specifically water the past 20 plus years. And uh, just to go over a couple of the projects, uh, larger projects, uh, we removed the uh, turf of the medians on Country Club Drive between Portola and Cook Street. This is uh, in front of the Marriott uh, Desert Springs. We also removed the turf on Cook Street uh, between Country Club and Hovely Lane East, which is on the east side of uh, the Marriott, the Villas. Uh, we also removed all the turf around the Civic Center campus a few years ago and converted all that to uh, desert landscape. Uh, and more recently, we removed the turf along Haystack Parkway from Highway 74 to Heliotrope. Uh, again, we uh, removed the turf and um, installed desert uh, water uh, efficient landscape. And also, we've been removing turf, a uh, passive uh, turf at our parks. Uh, the most recent project was uh, several passive uh, turf areas at the Holy Soccer Park. Um, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Sean. 
Thank you, Randy. Okay, so moving on, um, staff did do some research on um, the current use of artificial turf in um, local organizations and municipalities. So starting off with the school districts, um, Palm Springs Unified um, doesn't have a formal artificial turf use policy. However, they have implemented it in several areas, um, especially in high schools where students are walking and standing often and they have a hard time keeping natural grass green in those areas. And they've had some success with it. Um, they're also um, doing some analysis on using it for uh, sports fields, but have not implemented those quite yet. Um, at Desert Sands Unified, there also is no uh, formal policy on it, and um, they have done some research. They visited other um, artificial turf uh, fields in Southern California and have um, not implemented anything quite yet. Um, they brought it to the school board, however, it wasn't um, opted for at that time. Um, for local municipalities, uh, we discussed this with City of La Quinta, Indian Wells, and City of Indio. Um, no uh, local municipalities have a formal use policy on artificial turf. However, um, most of them use it in some uh, limited way. At City of La Quinta, it's used in the medians, um, and that has they've warned about the still intensive um, maintenance and upkeep of those medians, even with the artificial turf. Um, it still needs to be either brushed or vacuumed, rinsed off. Um, and so there is some maintenance with it as well. Um, in City of Indian Wells, they also use it in the medians and they brought up the cost of it. Um, that was a $50,000 project on Cook Street median that they did and that has lasted over 10 years, but they've ha had some really intensive maintenance with that and gone kind of above and beyond the manufacturer's recommendation for that. Um, and also they brought up the difficulty in disposing it. It's made mostly of plastic products. So um, finding a, a proper disposal site for it is um, difficult. In City of Indio, they use it underneath those uh, Indio signs that you see there in the picture. And the main thing that they brought up uh, with the, the maintenance of this is that the turf fades over time and you can't just cut out a piece that becomes damaged and replace it because the new piece will be much greener than the faded older piece. So you end up with this patchwork quilt type uh, look to it, which is not good. You have to really just replace the entire section to have it continue looking good. And then other uh, community organizations um, we have the National Recreation and Parks Association and the California Parks and Recreation Society that we rely upon for some sources of information like this. Um, looking at their discussion boards, uh, I was able to read several posts about the use of this. Um, one of them was a city asking about stormwater. Um, they had a, a bad experience with artificial turf in which the surrounding landscape had washed out onto the turf and created a mess during a rainstorm. So. Uh, stormwater is definitely a factor. Um, we also had discussed with another uh, municipality, uh, I think it was Chino Hills, that had some um, success with using it on athletic fields. Um, they didn't have any issue with it. They thought that the community was going to be against it, but um, as they um, used it more and more, uh, it became more favored in the community and they've had uh, pretty good success. But it is very intensive maintenance and um, they intend to continue forward with it. Um, the, one of the cons that they listed was the heat, and um, we know that it's a lot less hot there than it is here, so just kind of imagining the comparison uh, on an athletic field in the desert. Uh, going over some of the maintenance issues with artificial turf, um, you have to remove the debris through blowing or brushing. It must be rinsed off especially if you're using it in a place where you're gonna have dogs and things like that. Um, one of the things they mentioned in Chino Hills was that they sanitize the turf twice a year. Um, and so the company comes out and performs like this sanitary um, cleanup that happens. Um, they said that it's not required, but you think if there's any dogs using the park, then you're gonna to wanna to do that. Um, and then replenishing the base. So all of these artificial turf installations have either uh, coconut fiber, wood chips, or sand beneath them. And so every once in a while you have to replenish that base. And comparing those uh, maintenance items with natural grass, of course we have mowing, watering, 
overseeding, which is um, probably one of the higher expenses, and then um, fertilizing, which is done about four times per year. Comparing the costs of those, um, in general, artificial turf is going to have a higher upfront cost and lower overall maintenance cost. Um, I mentioned before, not patching those worn or damaged areas, you have to replace the, the whole area. Uh, so it's more practical for small areas. And then larger areas are less expensive to maintain with the natural grass. Um, overseeding and fertilizer is about $1,600 per acre annually. And we have about 75 acres of turf here in the city. And then of course, the cost of water. Just some other factors to con consider with artificial turf. Um, the appearance, smell, and feel of natural grass it can't really be replicated by artificial turf. Um, the water consumption is much higher with the natural uh, grass. Um, however, the heat is a lot lower. Um, again, with storm water, sometimes issues can be encountered if um, artificial grass is installed adjacent to other types of landscaping, such as desert landscaping. Um, Allergies are something that many people experience with natural grass and then the sanitation factor. And I just put this uh, graphic here about the heat island effect because um, installation of this type of the artificial turf material in areas that are already covered in concrete can also contribute to that factor. So again, we have a current informal policy that um, staff has been utilizing after the you know, implementation of the active use area designation on El Paseo. And just wanted to bring this up for discussion uh, for the council to consider in the future potentially adopting um, a, a formal policy for the use of artificial turf in the city. What is the informal policy? So the informal policy is that natural grass can be installed in recreational or active use areas, which are basically just the parks and that El Paseo median, just very limited areas throughout the city. Otherwise, artificial turf may be used, but in general, the city has opted for desert or low water use landscaping. Have we installed artificial turf any place? I defer to Randy Chavez on that. Yeah, we, we installed a small area in the El Paseo median. It's probably 20 by 50 um, uh, linear feet, uh, just as a test area. Um, but that's really the only other area that we've installed it. Uh, and just to add on to that, um, years ago, we did go and visit several facilities that claim to have artificial turf. One of the areas was uh, Sun City Palm Desert. And uh, the, we looked at the turf, artificial turf they installed in their dog park. And really, it was just a 10 by 10 piece. Um, they didn't install anymore because of the heat. So we have done our due diligence uh, to see where we could install it citywide. But there was really no practical area or, or sensible area where we would want to install it large scale. Or at all. Or, or at all. Okay. Questions? Let's quickly see if we have questions. Um, the only other question I have is, and maybe you alluded to this, but in your research, did you find information about any uh, adverse impact on the water supply as a result of forever chemicals? No, that is not something that I came across in my research. You had a comment. I'm convinced that artificial turf would not be good for the, the soccer park or any place you're going to be walking your dog or people are going to be walking on it. That, I think, with your presentation is what resonated with me. However, in some of the medians where nobody's going to be walking and it's just visual as you're driving down, say, Cook Street, and you've got the medians, perhaps breaking up the, the desert landscape with artificial turf would be more pleasing to the eye. And with these windy conditions that we have here in the desert, perhaps it, it helps, it mitigates the dust blowing into the air by having ground cover. So that's just a thought. Did you have a thought? I, of, of course I do. Uh, 
I, I liked how you closed your comments, we should not use it anywhere. Because the fact is, it, it does degrade. And then you have the plastic issue that goes into your soil and it does eventually wind up in water. Um, if, if just listening to the presentation, I would have thought you were trying to talk me out of artificial turf. That's how detrimental I think it is. Uh, there's lots of great medians we see that have no artificial turf, but they have an abundant amount of landscaping, which holds the, the decomposed granite, if that's what they're using, or any sand down. I don't see any good reason to use plastic carpeting in Palm Desert. <laughs> that's my feeling. Yes, Mayor Port. Yeah. Thank you. My question is in regards to the expected frequency of replacement in some of these cities. I imagine they're more coastal, their weather is a little better, but the intensity of our heat, how often do we anticipate the replacement? Yes, thank you. Um, several companies um, list about 10 to 15 years as their life expectancy for their products, and then they have their recommended uh, maintenance that goes along with that. Um, I spoke with the, the athletic director at Chino Hills, and they um, had their turf, artificial turf fields, athletic fields, for uh, about five years, and they were holding up well. But again, um, very frequent maintenance and that sanitization schedule that they have biannually. Mm -hmm. When I was attending the presentation for the parks, that was one of the questions that I was looking at the different levels of cushion. And he said, you've got the option for the palm fibers. And he said, you could recycle it. And I said, I, I doubt you'd be able to separate them. Is Did they mention which one would be better between the concept of the palm fibers and in case we do get areas that request it in any future policy where I agree right now is not a, it, it doesn't seem like there's anything favorable. It's not um, consistent with safety needs, but should in the future or a resident say, I, I want this in my yard. Is there any research that we could provide to say, be on the lookout, the coconut fiber versus the sand or while we're educating the public in our study session? Yes, so um, the intent is for staff to go back and conduct that additional research. We didn't dive that deep into the d different base types um, and things in the, for this presentation. However, I will tell you that I did read an article about um, the implementation of the coconut fiber as a base at, on athletic fields in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, and that they were not experiencing the same uh, heat levels that had been traditionally experienced with that type of product. So you're welcome. And... If I understand correctly, right now we're just looking at potential uses on city property. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. My perspective is we've gotten along just fine without it. And there are an infinite number of ways to enhance the beauty of medians and avoid monotony without using an artificial product. We can use different colors of rock, uh, naturally occurring. We can change the geometric positioning. Uh, I think staff has done a wonderful job uh, with our medians, and I hear lots of compliments. Uh, beyond all the negatives in this presentation, the key word for me in artificial turf is artificial, which just doesn't match the aesthetic uh, that we strive for in Palm Desert. So, any other thoughts? Yeah, just might as well add my two cents. I, I concur with uh, Jan and Mayor Kelly. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate the discussion. Uh, next. I'd like to uh, ask uh, 
is Neil Ennis to join us. Um, he has been uh, working on the final design for the PD Link project. Um, so we've just uh, completed an updated uh, design on that and are getting ready to put it out to bid, but we wanted to make sure that uh, council was apprised on exactly what we're bidding since there has been a few changes in the design. So Neil, I'll turn it over to you. All right, good afternoon, Madam Mayor, members of city council. I'm Neil Ennis, uh, project manager in CIP. And as Todd alluded to, we're gonna talk about PD Link. Um, it was previously referenced as the CV Link Painters Path Spur at Concept. It's a project that's planned to install approximately 1.75 miles of new active transportation corridors that will fulfill the uh, city's strategic plan while balancing functionality and operability of the impacted corridors. This photo shows the difference between the two uh, classifications of bike lanes that we're going to be putting in. And I'd also like to point out that the number of vehicle travel lanes on the impacted corridors will remain the same. This slide provides a plan view of the path network and type. Uh, the project mainly consists of the buffered bike paths identified in yellow and begins by extending the in-place bike cart pass from San Pablo south across Highway 111 onto El Paseo. The improvements to El Paseo from San Pablo to Highway 74 are currently installed and will remain in the current state as Shero designators. After crossing Highway 74, El Paseo will have traffic directional dedicated bike paths on each side of the street. A new crosswalk is planned at the intersection of Painter's Path and El Paseo. The path will become a protected bike lane um, along the north side of Painter's Path and will cross the footbridge over Palm Valley Channel and then transition into Sharrows uh, behind the town center and terminate at the CV Link interconnection and the trailhead of the bumping ground. I'd like to um, provide kind of overview on how we're gonna work package this to minimize impacts to the residents, businesses, and stakeholders. Um, we've assembled a phased approach where we'll begin the San Pablo work um, and then move over to the Painter's Path CVW bumping ground trail and the El Paseo and Painter's Pass intersection. Uh, finally, we'll move north along Town Center and terminate at Fred Waring. Uh, next up is a slated schedule. We're doing a council study session. We're gonna move ahead into business outreach in January and February. We're forecasting to bid and award the project in March and begin our construction on phase one and phase two in April and May, and then move into more of the high traffic areas, the business zones essentially um, during low season. So in summary, um, I've listed kind of a few highlights on the slide in front of us. Um, I wanted to mention the soft features that are included in this project. We have fixed stations, benches, bike racks, water stations, art and public spaces. And we have also included the maintenance on the wearing courses throughout the city, uh, fixed potholes, things of that nature, and surface defects. So I'm available for any questions on the project and on the presentation. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, I need clarification about the major business portion of El Paseo. Am I correct that we're keeping the Sharrows as the solution in that stretch? Correct. So there won't be any disruption or construction affecting our El Paseo businesses. That is accurate. Right. Other questions? I do have a question, please. Can you go back to the first, or maybe it was the second slide, the deck? That one. Nope. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. It was the third, in fact. <laughs> one more, please. Okay. So I just have to ask this question, and I think I know the answer, but I have to ask anyway. Is it possible when we look at how we come around on El Paseo, then segueing into Town Center Way, 
And what we're asking people to do is cross 111 exactly right in that area. Is there, and you know, CV Link has done well by building on the side of the whitewater wash. So when we look at the stormwater uh, channel that comes down uh, along that we see that there that goes along the mountain and is there no way that we could take painter's path, work with CVWD and go on the shoulder of that stormwater channel and then under Highway 111? Yeah, that's a wonderful question and concept and our staff has done the legwork previously on the availability, the head clearance on the overcrossing of the bridge of 111 over the Palm Valley Channel and that is not a option. Darn, okay, thank you. Good idea. <laughs> it would be a fun design and safe too. Is there a quick way to explain why? It's impractical. There's not enough height space for the embankment and the bridge. It's a very small gap. Um, quick question about Painter's Path. Is there a reason why? I mean, I'm not a big fan of, of uh, protected bike lanes at this point. I thought the experiment on Mag Falls was a so-so, and I'm glad we kind of did away with Haystack. Why just Painter's Path as a protected bike path versus buffered? Certainly. Um, we're looking to uh, pick up grant money, and part of that is uh, putting in the Class 4 uh, protected cycle track. Okay. And then um, beyond that, the you got kind of a choke point. I mean, I know there's only about 100 yards, 50 yards of sidewalk that connects that bridge behind Target or going over that flood control to Painter's Path. Will there be any improvements made to that sidewalk and bridge, or will that be, remain the way it is? Yeah, just... To answer that specifically, as we transition from the bridge, we're working with CVWD on the right of way and getting a new standard bike path put through the CVW right of way uh, outside of the parking and truck loadings. Hmm. Okay, so no, and the bridge will need to be replaced. Is that right? Our bridge will remain in place. Okay. Yes. Okay. And going back to Mayor Kelly, um, she mentioned the business portion of El Paso. I guess I'm, were you referring to east of? 74 to Portola and the show. Yes. Okay, perfect. I just want to clarify. Thank you. All good. All right. Uh, Councilmember Droopy, could you educate us further at, as an avid bicyclist uh, why you are not a fan of protected bike paths? Yeah, when you put... Um, I, by and large, I think we have a really good network of boulevards and wide roads here with good asphalt. And once you give us, once you give cyclists specifically like an eight foot wide striped bike lane that keeps us in the flow with traffic. In other words, I find that to be the safest solution when you, when you have the protected bike lanes and you, you, you then put opposing traffic in the same lane, uh, bikers, golf cart, joggers, walkers, like on Magnesia Falls, I think that creates more opportunities for accidents, you know, head-on collisions and creates a little confusion also because then you have to direct uh, traffic across, uh, bike traffic across lanes of auto traffic to get into that two-way lanes, those two-way lanes. I, I think we, anyway, that's, I think it causes more problems than good in our city. Yeah, this project does none of that. Okay. I hope that clarifies. All right, thank, thank you. you. Does that conclude our business? Yes, it does. We'll see you uh, at 3.30 sharp.